Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Books and Books and Coral Gables. Thank you all for coming down tonight. As you can see from these uh, lights and these cameras, we are live streaming this event on the Internet tonight. A note for our Internet audience at home, if at any time during the presentation you would like to purchase a copy of tonight's book, you could call the number on your screen. Uh, we will have the author sign that for you, and we will ship it to you wherever you are in the United States free of charge. Uh, for those of you watching overseas, the shipping charge might just be just a little more. Uh, this evening, Books and Books is very happy to welcome Ms. Anna Whitelock and her new book, The Queen's Bed, An Intimate History of Elizabeth's Court. Dr. Whitelock is a historian, author, or should I say an historian? I don't know. Author and broadcaster. She received her PhD in history from Corpus Christi College, Cambridge, in 2004. Her articles and book reviews on various aspects of Tudor history have appeared in many publications, including The Guardian, The Times Literary Supplement, and BBC History. She has taught at Cambridge University and is now a senior lecturer in early modern history and the director of the Center for Public History at Royal Holloway, University of London. In this book, Dr. Whitelock offers a revealing look at the Elizabethan court and the politics of intimacy. She dramatically reconstructs, for the first time, the queen's quarters and the women who controlled them. It is a story of sex, gossip, conspiracy, and intrigue brought to life amid the colors, textures, and routines of the court. The women who attended the queen held the truth about her health, chastity, and fertility. They were her friends, confidants, and spies. And until now, historians have overlooked them. The Queen's Bed is a revelatory look into their daily lives, the untold story of the Queen laid bare. Here to tell us more about it, please give a very warm welcome to Dr. Anna Whitelock. Good evening, and thank you very much. Um, Yes, I want to introduce you to my book a little bit, hopefully whet your appetite, um, which might encourage you, of course, to purchase it. Some of you might have read it already. Um, my intention when writing the book was to try and say something different about a queen when, which obviously she's had so much written about her, novels, biographies, uh, countless films. Um, so it's very difficult, you would imagine, to try and find something new. But I decided that I wanted to try and uh, take a look behind closed doors, as it were, to try and get beyond the image uh, that I think we're probably all familiar with of Elizabeth as this kind of woman who certainly in portraits is shown sort of never really to age. She remains this kind of ever young figure. And of course, her portraits show her in an ever more kind of idealized way. Um, young, standing, uh, almost like a goddess in certain f pictures. But I wanted to reconstruct really Elizabeth the woman and reconstruct the life really of her court and even more the life and goings on in her bedchamber and particularly in and around the Queen's bed. Now you may think, well, we know that Elizabeth was uh, the Virgin Queen. That's one of the things she's most famous for. So there surely isn't very much uh, in terms of uh, gossip, sex and salacious uh, detail uh, to recover in terms of the Queen's bed. However, as I was conducting my research, I found that in fact that wasn't the case. And there was a whole lot of things being said about the Queen's bed and the goings-on in it uh, throughout her reign. And far from uh, being talked about as the Virgin Queen for much of her reign, uh, she was actually talked about in entirely different terms. So that's one of the threads uh, which I'll pick up on in a moment of the book. But I also wanted, as I say, to reconstruct the kind of idea of Elizabeth the woman. I think when we're thinking about history, uh, it's very hard in some sense to cast our minds or take ourselves back to a period that is so unfamiliar to our own, something, you know, five centuries or so uh, in the past. But I was kind of struck with a sense that apart from all the things that were very unfamiliar, there are, of course, things that remained the same. Human beings don't change that much. They feel the same kinds of things caused by different kinds of uh, fears, different kinds of pains, uh, but certain things remain the same. Um, 
And so that was one of the sort of pressing things that I wanted to think about. What about Elizabeth the woman? What does she feel? What, what made her uh, stay awake at night? Uh, what does she look like? What were her anxieties? And the way in which I thought I could get closest to her in terms of telling the narrative of uh, her life at court was by focusing on the bed. And I love bed. Um, I love being in bed. It's a place of great refuge for me. Uh, I can hide away from the world. And so the idea of sort of, I don't know, cast, being able to empathise with Elizabeth, this queen who, of course, is such an iconic image. We think of her rallying her troops uh, on the eve of the Armada. But of course, like all the rest of us, she went to bed. And there she could be most vulnerable and most human. Uh, and that was the kind of central focus that I wanted to take. Elizabeth, uh, the woman, in her bed and in her bedchamber. Now, of course, there was no such thing as a private life uh, for a monarch. And all that went on in the bedchamber was the subject of much speculation. And it was also, as I said, where Elizabeth was most vulnerable. It was where her body, her natural body, a body that would age, uh, that would be ill, all of those kind of things, which, of course, the Elizabethan government wanted to disguise. They didn't want to show uh, the Queen to have any kind of weakness. And particularly because Elizabeth was unmarried. And of course, she remained unmarried throughout her reign. And this raised all kinds of anxieties. Uh, it was the expectation at the time that women should marry. Uh, women were believed to be ruled by their emotions, by lust and uh, not by reason. Um, and they needed a man in order to provide the stable uh, part of uh, life. It was also true that actually at the time, women were regarded as being uh, sort of, in terms of medical discourse, actually more sexually voracious than men. Uh, their bodies were seen as in a constant state of flux. And for a woman to actually be uh, healthy, it was believed that she needed to be married because she really needed to be having regular sex. And so this adds to a sense that, first of all, Elizabeth had to marry. And, that, and sort of alongside that, the idea that, of course, well, how could she possibly remain chaste if she wasn't married? Um, and, of course, all of this is exaggerated by the need as a monarch to produce a successor. And, of course, because she was the queen, uh, not only was she the monarch, but she was also the means by which this successor was to be produced. So these women who uh, looked after Elizabeth in her bedchamber, and I identified about 28 over the um, course of Elizabeth's reign, and they would have a range of jobs. They would be there to uh, attend on the queen when she was in her bedchamber, to help her dress, to help her put on her wigs, put on her makeup, um, tend to her really every whim. They would also be companions for her during the day, um, but equally they would be companions to her during the night. And again, in my uh, researches, I came to identify a small group of women who might be described as bedfellows of the Queen. Now, it was a common practice at the time for uh, people to share beds uh, in an entirely non-sexualized way. Uh, masters and servants shared beds. Uh, and Elizabeth would sleep either alongside one of her trusted ladies in the royal bed or with one of her ladies on a truckle bed, a sort of pull-me-out bed, uh, by the side of her. Now, this was for comfort. Uh, Elizabeth, I mean, one of the things that, by looking at the bedchamber and thinking about Elizabeth as a woman in that space, I recovered all kinds of different sorts of information. For example... Elizabeth was a real insomniac and she was also afraid of the dark. So quite a different idea of Elizabeth, this kind of iconic queen. And she liked having these women around her uh, during the night uh, for, as sources of comfort and counsel. These women were also there as a source of protection. Um, it was feared that Elizabeth might be assassinated uh, in the bedchamber. And indeed, as I talk about in the book, there's a number of plots uh, that are... Uh, talked about which uh, aim to uh, assassinate Elizabeth. One of them, a sort of bizarre plot, seeks to blow up Elizabeth uh, with gunpowder planted under her bed in the bedchamber. Because, of course, Elizabeth was, for Catholics, a uh, illegitimate queen. And uh, this is the central idea. I mean, we're not just talking about, I may be sort of toying with you with the title of the book, The Queen's Bed, and suggesting all kinds of titillating information, which there was. 
But also the fact is the Queen's bed and the Queen's body was this incredibly important political site in uh, the war of faith that, of course, divided Europe. Catholics called into question uh, Elizabeth's health and Elizabeth's chastity as a way of seeking to undermine her rule and therefore uh, her reign. And of course, waiting in the wings, if Elizabeth died or if Elizabeth's reign was called into disrepute, was of course the Catholic Mary, Queen of Scots. So the stakes were incredibly high to protect the Queen's body physically to keep her alive, but also to protect her uh, from rumours of unchaste behaviour. And as I recovered during the course of my researches, there were so many rumours about what was going on in Elizabeth's bedchamber, particularly, of course, focusing on a character who I'm sure you're very familiar with, Robert Dudley. Now, when I started my uh, researches, one of the questions that I was asked by almost anybody I had told I was working on this topic was, well, did they or didn't they, Elizabeth and Robert Dudley? And um, it's nice to sort of finally be suggesting my answer to an American audience because I've been saying for some time, I think she probably gave a kind of Clinton-esque answer. Uh, perhaps everything but. I think probably Elizabeth ended the reign as a virgin but not necessarily as a good girl, some might say. It was too risky. But the point is that regardless of whether she did or she didn't, people at the time suspected that she did or she was. And... There are countless uh, descriptions in letters from ambassadors of uh, Elizabeth and Dudley and the various uh, liaisons, uh, the, the meetings that they were having uh, by day and by night, as one ambassador describes it. Uh, Dudley was showing himself far too familiarly with the Queen. Um, and these aren't just rumours that are being spread by hostile ambassadors to, uh, who are seeking to undermine Elizabeth's reign, given that they had Catholic sympathies. This is also rumours that are circulating within England itself. There's countless letters from local uh, commissioners of the peace to the Privy Council in London saying, for example, there was this, this woman um, called... Uh, Mother Dowell, as she appears in the record, a 67-year-old widow from Essex, just outside London, who was arrested for asserting that the Queen was pregnant by Robert Dudley. And the Privy Council were writing, in, um, or the Commissioners of the Peace are writing to London saying, what shall we do with her? I could give you countless examples of that. One uh, reported incident by an ambassador was that Elizabeth and Dudley had slept together on New Year's Day, 1566. Uh, it was rumoured that when Elizabeth went on her progresses around the country, she was in fact going away because she was pregnant and was going away to lie in and therefore, and then disguise the fact that she was pregnant. Uh, these are the kind of rumours that are absolutely circulating. Now this is why, of course, her women become increasingly important because they were the only ones who could vouch for her chastity. And of course, uh, they would be sought out uh, and bribed for the ultimate information by different ambassadors, who of course wanted to know the truth of Elizabeth's relationship with Robert Dudley, because Elizabeth was highly desirable, marriageable stock in Europe. She was an incredibly uh, powerful woman, obviously. And if she was chaste, she would be somebody that many foreign princes would wish to marry. If she wasn't chaste and there was substance to the rumours, then of course, absolutely not. So we see countless instances of ambassadors being sent to England and then seeking to bribe the women of the bedchamber to find out what was the truth of these rumours and them being told by their uh, the foreign courts, you know, only offer uh, the hand of whoever it is, their prince in marriage, if there is no substance to the rumours. And there's an example of one of her ladies, a woman called Kat Ashley, actually having vouched for Elizabeth publicly uh, and saying, of course, nothing improper was happening between her and Dudley. There's an episode where uh, Kat Ashley falls on her knees in the bedchamber at Hampton Court and says she would rather have strangled Elizabeth in her cradle, she'd actually been there with Elizabeth from Elizabeth's infancy, than see her carrying on in such a way that was undermining herself and the realm. So it was these women had a very, very important role to play. They were also bribed by ambassadors, uh, as were Elizabeth's laundresses, to find out uh, about Elizabeth's menstrual cycle. Now, Elizabeth's menstrual cycle was one of the most written about topics at the time. In fact, Elizabeth had politically the most important womb in Europe for uh, many, many years. 
Everybody seemed to have a view on Elizabeth's menstrual cycle. The papal nuncio in France, for example, in the mid-1570s, was declaring that she had a womanish infirmity. Therefore, she couldn't have children. And the women would be bribed and be petitioned by ambassadors to find out basically whether there, were blood, there was blood on the sheets. I mean, it was as intimate and as detailed as that. They wanted to know whether Elizabeth was uh, healthy, whether she was fertile, because, of course, again, it would be no point marrying her if... Uh, uh, she wasn't fertile and likely to have children. So these are the kinds of details that we find uh, really uh, scattered through the record. I mentioned also, of course, the fact these women are tasked with uh, making Elizabeth up in the morning. And again, the sort of revelation to me was the fact that this took up to a couple of hours a day. This Elizabeth, you know, the lacing, the uh, buttoning in, the fastening into the gowns. I mean, it was a huge operation. She would need a woman there all the time. Um, she would also have to have lots and lots of makeup, of course. Her famous makeup plastered onto her face, which, of course, was lead-based. And it's very likely that she probably suffered from some kind of lead poisoning. Uh, sort of, it can affect uh, sort of in a bit, your speech. It can give you indigestion, headaches, all kinds of uh, loss of concentration. Um, and Elizabeth did suffer from persistent headaches. Um, she also suffered from depression at different points. Um, for, a t what, for one um, sh episode, one autumn, just four years into Elizabeth's reign, uh, she actually fell ill with smallpox. This, and there was a real fear that she was going to die. Um, she fell unconscious for a time, literally all eyes focus on the bedchamber in England and across Europe. Um, and when Elizabeth comes round from being unconscious and she sees her counsellors gathered fearfully around the bed, she intriguingly says, in the event of her death, she would like Robert Dudley to be protector of the realm. Uh, and when she sees the kind of uh, raised eyebrows from her counsellors, she says, yes, but nothing improper had ever passed between them as God's, God was her witness. But clearly at that moment, he was the man she trusted. But it also underlined that smallpox episode, how vulnerable the queen's body was. And of course, if she died... Uh, that would be the end of the party. It would be the end of the Tudor dynasty. Uh, there was no successor. And of course, waiting in the wings, as I said, was Mary, Queen of Scots, who would have brought about a Catholic restoration. So it would have been the end of Protestant England. So these women have to uh, attend to the face of the Queen, who, of course, during the course of her reign, grew old. Again, something, a sort of basic fact that in some ways isn't sort of familiar when we think of Elizabeth. She grew from being a sort of 20-something, attractive, slender, pretty-faced uh, woman, think Kate Blanchett, to um, a woman in her 60s. Now, I have to sort of add the caveat here because I give uh, talks all over the place and often there's women of a certain age in the audience and at the moment when I talk about uh, Elizabeth evolving into a 60-something, a, a quite unattractive 60-something with sort of teeth falling out and balding hair. I, I sense hostility kind of coming to me. So I have to add the necessary caveat that this is the sort of six, being 60 in the 16th century. It's a very, very different situation about being... We now, you know, HRT, yoga, coconut juice, kale, whatever we're doing, everybody obviously looks fantastic when they're 60. Elizabeth really didn't. But this, of course, could not be revealed... Uh, because to do that, to show that the Queen was ageing, was to basically uh, reveal what her reign amounted to, which, of course, was a political dead end. Uh, there was no successor. There was real fear about what was going to happen on her death. And so, hence the need to just cover in makeup, put on the wig, disguise the fact that her hair was falling out. She also had very, very rotten teeth. Uh, she loved sweet food. Uh, she was a real picker with food. Lots of dishes would come in and be presented before her. She was like, yeah, not really bothered. But she loved sweet food, custard-based desserts, uh, marzipan, uh, tarts, and so on. And she ate a lot of those, and her teeth ultimately got rotten and fell out. One episode I talk about was where she had incredibly bad toothache. And... Um, she ends up having to have her tooth pulled out and says, after, you know, after the pain of that, I'll never have that done again. And these kind of revealing kind of human insights for me were really intriguing. Uh, also, the fact that Elizabeth was incredibly short-sighted, um, as am I. And without my contact lenses, I couldn't really get out of bed in the morning without falling over. So suddenly I completely saw Elizabeth through sort of, well, excuse the pun, through different eyes. Um, just, you know, the sort of need to be squinting to try and read things, how that would cause all kinds of headaches, which she uh, continued to suffer from. Again, this very sort of human, different kind of perspective on Elizabeth um, the Queen. Not only was there a need for this makeup to be plastered onto Elizabeth's face and, got, and of course that got ever thicker 
The government also did a kind of 16th century Photoshop job on Elizabeth's portraits. Because what we see from the 1570s when Elizabeth was starting to age is a very uh, carefully controlled, officially sanctioned face pattern being adopted. In other words, a pattern was... uh, of, or an image of Elizabeth's face uh, was painted that then was inserted into subsequent portraits. And we think that really from the 1570s, Elizabeth didn't sit for any portraits anymore, and it was actually her women that were sitting for the portraits, dressed in Elizabeth's gowns. And we know that they were her gowns because what's pictured in portraits marries up to what appears in the household records. Um, but the face pattern, if you go back and have a look at the uh, pictures, you'll see that it may be from you know, in reverse or whatever, but it's essentially, there's two different face patterns introduced at different points in the reign, but the mask of youth is clearly fixed. Elizabeth can't be shown to age. So all of this, of course, is going on. Petitions for Elizabeth to marry. Her women are desperate to see Elizabeth married uh, because of the rumours about Robert Dudley. And in fact, they end up, for example, writing to Eric of Sweden and say, come on, you know, Elizabeth's really keen to marry you. She may pretend she's not, but come over, give her some jewels. And when she says she's not interested, that's just what English women are like. They play hard to get. So, and Elizabeth, when she found out, was not happy. And a number of her women were banished from court for a time. But the very interesting thing is, you know, when I, if you look at the book, you'll see that there's all these kind of rumours, the details about Elizabeth carrying on with Robert Dudley, the fact that people really did talk about the court as a sort of hotbed of lust, that she was kind of casting these young men into her spell. And of course, Elizabeth also was sort of started from a bit of a sticky wicket in terms of the fact that she was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, who, of course, for Catholics was the great whore of Europe. And so Elizabeth, by obviously by association, was the little whore. And so for many Catholics, it was simply like mother, like daughter. Um, and this just added to the sense of uh, Elizabeth's reputation being constantly called into question. So where on earth does the whole idea of the Virgin Queen come from? Well, in fact, it was a brilliant piece of political spin because via the 1570s, when what uh, emerged as the last uh, of Elizabeth's marriage prospects came to the fore, that was the Duke of Anjou. Elizabeth, it seems for a time, was really entertaining the prospect of marrying him. And in fact, she announced at court that she would marry him and her and the Duke of Anjou exchanged uh, rings. And that night, though, when Elizabeth retired to the bedchamber, there's accounts of how her women, you know, waxed and wailed and said, no, 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 you can't do this. It's not a good thing. And the next day, Elizabeth actually said no to the Duke of Anjou. I think it's best that we remain friends. Why, oh, why, you might say. Surely everybody wanted Elizabeth to marry. That was what was the petitions all through the reign. Well, of course, by the 1570s, Elizabeth was getting on a bit. And there was suddenly a real fear that actually, what's the point? If she married, she was probably too old to have a child. And if she did get pregnant, she may well die in childbirth. And so we start to see a completely different Elizabeth beginning to be created. And it's essentially to solve the problem. That is, what do you do when you have a post-menopausal single queen on the throne? How do you make a virtue of the fact that it's essentially a political dead end? She's just getting old. There's no children. There's no prospect of uh, marriage and a secure succession. Well, you make a virtue of her virginity. Suddenly, the fact that she is barren becomes a great political strength. She's actually not married because she's actually sacrificed herself not to a man but to the realm. And so her virginity becomes a symbol of this sort of impregnable body. And you begin to look, if you see portraits, you'll see Elizabeth begins to get covered in pearls, symbols of chastity, and the elevation of her as the Virgin Queen begins. And, I mean, perfectly, of course, Elizabeth then oversees the defeat of the Armada. Now, you may think, why on earth is that related? Well, if you go and look at the Armada portrait, um, and the Armada portrait, which is... Elizabeth is there sort of very much focusing on her body. There's the defeated armada in the background. Elizabeth there is covered in pearls. There is also a strategically placed bow. Go back and have a look at the picture. It's in the groin area. It's very deliberately a symbol and a sign of Elizabeth as the Virgin Queen. Because, of course, what you have celebrated in that portrait is the notion of Elizabeth overseeing the defeat of the armada and therefore 
really that amounted to the body politic remaining impregnable. England's shores were not uh, penetrated, if you like. And in the same way, Elizabeth's body remained impregnable too. So you have this complete sort of symmetry of the, the state, the realm, the body politic and Elizabeth's own body. And so this elevation of Elizabeth as the Virgin Queen uh, continues. So in many ways, you may imagine, you know, did Elizabeth have the last laugh? We're all still thinking about her as the Virgin Queen. And somehow all of that discourse that I talk about uh, perhaps really hasn't really made it into the popular uh, imagination. Well, two things really to throw in there uh, to finish. Um, One is the fact that intriguingly, Elizabeth leaves an order on her death that her body should not be opened up and uh, disemboweled and filled with preservatives, as was the custom of the time. Uh, It took a number of weeks for monarchs to uh, be buried and so on the funeral. Elizabeth left this order, and historians have speculated on why might that be the case. Was she trying to hide something? Did she simply want to maintain this sort of aura of having a, a body that remained intact that was never examined? Was she fearful that there was, in fact, uh, some kind of physical defect that would be exposed if her body was examined? One uh, character called John Harrington, who was writing later, who was actually the son of one of Elizabeth's bedfellows, he said, and he may well have just been trying to show his own sort of influence and insight, but he says that the reason why this was the case, and he knew this because, as as this tract that he wrote says, because my mother was one of the Queen's bedfellows, He says this was because Elizabeth was seeking to sustain the ultimate secret of state, which was that she had a womanish infirmity and that she never intended to marry, but simply maintained the kind of dalliance on the prospect of marrying as a sort of political tool. Uh, But in fact, she would never marry because she would never put her body on the line because she knew she wouldn't be able to have children. So intriguing and a very different kind of way to think about Elizabeth and I mean one of the sort of images that I end towards the end the book with or two images that again sort of show how the bedchamber can be a really illuminating lens through which look at the court after the armada which I mentioned and the court and London is celebrating uh, the defeat of the Spanish armada Elizabeth uh, retires to her bedchamber and barricades herself in and in the end the door has to be broken down Why, you may imagine? Well, because Robert Dudley had died and Elizabeth was devastated. So in the midst of this great public jubilation, in fact, as a woman, she's grieving. She's desperate because Robert Dudley has died. One of the other sort of images is that I think is very haunting is in the very last days of Elizabeth's life, she uh, refuses to go to bed. She knows that this time her bed will be her deathbed. And so, in fact, she spends her uh, last few days lying on cushions in the f- on the floor in the privy chamber and ultimately has to be carried to bed because she sort of refuses to go herself. So it's this sort of very tragic image of this sort of once iconic beauty having to be carried to bed where, of course, she finally died. Um, I'm going to leave it there and uh, open up the floor to any questions I could tease and tantalize you with the other bits and bobs from the book but um i think i'll open it up to you and uh see if anybody wants to ask me anything uh or i can just carry on talking taking you through page by page of the book but i wouldn't do that because you have to buy it anybody got any questions yes it's understandable that elizabeth didn't want necessarily to marry a foreign prince and therefore lose the power that she had But it's equally strange that she didn't want to have a successor and therefore leave it to Catholic Mary's children to take Mm. over the throne. Why do you think she didn't marry and didn't have a child? I think she didn't marry because... I mean, I think she hadn't made a decision at the beginning of the reign, as some people say, you know, she intended to live and die a virgin. The expectation was that she should marry. Some historians have suggested she had some kind of psychological aversion to marriage because of what had happened to her mother, uh, Anne Boleyn, with Henry VIII. I don't think that was the case. I think for the early part of her reign, she was infatuated with Robert Dudley. Robert Dudley was, of course, married... uh, Robert Dudley's wife was reported to have had breast cancer and therefore was expected to die prematurely, but then is found dead at the bottom of a staircase. And, of course, then uh, suspicion is that, uh, you know, Dudley had sort of bumped his wife off and by implication Elizabeth might be associated with it. So there was no way that that was ever going to be a prospect. None of the, her counsel were then, un- or 
her council were not unanimously behind any of the subsequent uh, claimants, if you like, for Elizabeth's hand. And then time went on and it got to a point where it was no longer uh, useful to marry because of her age. The interesting question you also raise about why she didn't name a successor, which, I mean, I find that incredible. I mean, back in England, Elizabeth is sort of celebrated as being one of our greatest Britons. We had a, a BBC poll in 2000, and um, she was up there as the greatest, one of the greatest Britons, along with Churchill and Shakespeare and Princess Diana. Um, and, but what surprises me is that, of course, Elizabeth actually failed in the main job of a monarch, which was to preserve the succession. And with her death, the sort of the much celebrated Tudor dynasty dies out. And of course, not only that, but with her death, we see the arrival of a Scottish king. Uh, and back in England, we're still trying to work out what we feel about uh, our uh, union with Scotland. So, you know, she had a lot to answer for, but we don't hold that against her. Uh, but the reason I think that she didn't name a successor was because she describes, she said, why would I want to... Um, why would I want to sort of name the rising sun? In other words, she knew that during her sister Mary's reign, she was a rallying point for uh, disaffected subjects. So she was a sort of figurehead for a number of conspiracies against her sister Mary. And she feared that by naming a successor, he would be a rallying point for those who were disaffected with her rule. Um, and so she didn't. It's said that on her, on her death, when she pretty much, I mean, she was sort of lost the ability to speak at the end, it's said by a number of uh, chroniclers and people that were there at the time that when James was mentioned as whether he should be her successor, she made a crown shape above her head. Now, of course, it's very convenient for people who wanted to support the accession of James for them to subsequently say, oh, yeah, Elizabeth, you know, when she was dying, she made this gesture. Of course, this is what she wanted. Um, the reality is that behind Elizabeth's back, or at least Elizabeth wouldn't uh, publicly acknowledge that she knew about it, for some months, uh, letters had been sent between London and Edinburgh uh, to uh, basically facilitate a smooth transition of power. There was a real fear on Elizabeth's death that all hell was going to be let loose, that there was going to be civil war, the ports were blockaded, uh, treasures were put in the Tower of London. There was absolute fear that, that you know it was just going to be absolute chaos. And in order to prevent that, uh, people like Robert Cecil and before his execution, the Earl of Essex had actually been in touch with James, just saying, look, back off, hold your nerve, don't raise an army, um, you know, we will... Uh, look to you when the time comes and actually a whole sort of plot or, or plan was put in place that when Elizabeth died uh, her, a ring would be uh, given by one of the ladies of the uh, bedchamber to uh, her brother to Robert Carey who would then ride swiftly from London to Edinburgh and then give James the ring and he knew that would then be a sign that Elizabeth had actually died. But what's incredible is that it was a smooth succession, you know, against all the odds when James, of course, was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. He was an alien uh, in sort of legal description. He was regarded as foreign. Um, why on earth would England accept him? Well, I think the short answer to that is, uh, as many people described at the time, England was, we uh, was weary of an old woman's government. And, of course, James held the promise of uh, certainty and succession. He was married... He had three children, two sons and uh, a daughter. He had a ready-made family. And I think there was a collective sigh of relief uh, that finally England once more had a royal family and that the future uh, looked to be assured. And I think that was highly attractive and sort of mitigated against the fact that he was uh, Scottish, at least then. Yes. Uh, while she understandably remained silent about who she wanted to succeed her, who do you think in your studies that she would have picked? Would it have been the Protestant side of the Tudors or the son of a woman who she had executed? I think uh, the question was, who do I think Elizabeth would want to have succeeded her? I think what's really striking is the fact that Elizabeth was very careless about it. I mean, the fact is, you know, the fact that she didn't name a successor even at the end... Uh, was pretty selfish, uh, she, you know, and quite remarkable in many ways. Um, I think she would acknowledge that James uh, had a claim uh, to the throne um, through the Tudor dynasty, through Henry VIII's eldest sister. And so she had a great deal of respect for sort of legitimacy and right. And um, so I think she probably, and sort of, you know, probably did by a nod and a wink and not, you know, it's very 
probable that she knew exactly what was going on with the correspondence between, you know, Essex and Robert Cecil to James. But she just didn't want to be sort of aware of it publicly. Uh, and so I think, yes, she knew that James was going to succeed. And she was all right about that. But she she was quite selfish. She was more conscious of her own reputation, I think, and just wanting to die as, you know, the sole focus of attention. And, and in that sense was, you know, pretty irresponsible uh, and quite careless. Yes. Do we know how she felt about her mother? Did she ever write anything about her? She didn't mention, and the question was, what did we know what Elizabeth felt about her mother? Um, she doesn't refer very much to her mother. Um, only, I mean, only a few um, occasions there's, there's references to her mother because, of course, her mother was such a contentious figure uh, both in England and um, across Europe. And, and as I said, you know, for many, Anne Boleyn was the king's whore and by sort of identifying herself too explicitly with her mother, that was, you know, going to be more problematic in terms of her, the representation of herself. Um, so, no, I mean, not directly, although she does. I mean, many of the women that she appoints to the bedchamber are kind of cousins of the Boleyn family. So there is a sort of familial network there of sorts. Um, but she doesn't emphasize uh, too much in terms of the sort of representation of herself, the fact that she was the daughter of um, Anne Boleyn. Is there any mother figure? Yes, the question was, is there or was there a mother figure? Well, yes, indeed. Cat Ashley, who I mentioned was one of the sort of ladies of the bedchamber, and another Blanche Parry were with Elizabeth, uh, really from her infancy. They'd both been appointed when Elizabeth was a young child, a baby, and they uh, remained with her till they died. Uh, Cat Ashley in the 1560s, Blanche Parry later. Blanche Parry ended up sort of in her 70s, I think, when she died, and she was pretty much blind, and Elizabeth just kept her at court and looked after her. And I think these women were the closest thing that Elizabeth had to a mother. And they were the ones who really took her to task about the way she was behaving. And she was, although she sort of banished them from a time, uh, you know, for a time from court, you know, they were the ones who could uh, could say those things to Elizabeth. She, you know, she she trusted them most of all. And um, yes, I mean, I think they were the nearest thing she had to a mother figure. And when her ladies start to die, as they do towards the end of the reign, uh, she's devastated by it. She takes it very, very uh, badly indeed. And it really does sort of precipitate this whole process of depression and decline. Uh, and she's sort of left, sort of bereft of those people who had been with her throughout her life. I have a question that uh, came from the internet audience watching at home. Okay. It's from Danny. They wanted to know what was Elizabeth's age when she was queen. I guess it would be more instructive to find out at what age did she assume the throne and at what yeah, age. She was in her 20s and she was almost 70 when she died. Um, so we're talking about sort of five decades of uh, a life and that's what's so striking. You know, this woman change dramatically of course we all do uh, when we're in our 20s to when we're in our late 60s and I mean that's not only Elizabeth's appearance but of course her personality too um, again also changed and I think that's another sort of way in which looking at Elizabeth as as a woman rather than simply as this sort of unchanging iconic queen is quite instructive and you know it's quite a long life that she that she led um, a, a remarkable one um, there's no doubt about that, but ultimately quite a tragic, I think, in this way that she sort of died uh, in these circumstances. And of course, the sort of intriguing fact is that when Elizabeth died, I said she tried to control uh, her body by it not being um, opened. But of course, Elizabeth was buried in Westminster Abbey in the Henry VII Chapel, uh, a, the chapel which was, she was in the tomb with the founders of the Tudor dynasty, her grandfather, Henry VII, and his wife, Elizabeth of York. It was a highly desirable spot. You were right there with the founders of the Tudor dynasty. So she was buried there. However, she didn't remain there because three years after uh, Elizabeth's death, her body was uh, dug up and moved on the instruction of James. James uh, decided that he wanted that spot in the uh, Westmin in the chapel, in the tomb of Henry VII, for himself when his time came. He was very kind of conscious about sort of posterity and how he would be regarded, and he was very keen to emphasise his links with the Tudors. So Elizabeth's body was dug up and moved to the left-hand side of the aisle to um, what was essentially an unmarked spot, but in fact was where her sister, Mary Tudor, was buried. Mary Tudor had no great monument. It's said that there were just some broken altar stones marking the spot where Mary was buried. So Elizabeth's body is going to be placed on top of that of her sister. But that's not the end of James's tomb raiding because he actually decides uh, at the same time that he's going to move his mother 
His mother, of course, Mary, Queen of Scots, who was executed in 1587, uh, buried in Peterborough Cathedral, which is north of London. And he instructs that her body be moved down from Peterborough to London. And it's going to be placed on the other side of the aisle in Westminster, in the Henry VII Chapel in Westminster Abbey, uh, in a line with a whole series of other women who propagated the dynasty, if you like, Margaret Beaufort, the mother of Henry VII, and so on. So there was this whole line of fertile women. And he placed his mother in that line, wanting to restore her as uh, a woman who had, if you like, propagated the dynasty. So what was going on on the other side? Well, he does build Elizabeth uh, a monument. And many of you might have been to Westminster Abbey and seen it. But the, by the movement of her body, he was actually uh, saying something quite interesting and turning Elizabeth's claims to be the Virgin Queen uh, on its head. Because really what he was doing is building a mausoleum of barren Tudor queens. These were women who hadn't produced an heir. Of course, Mary Tudor had had failed, desperately sad phantom pregnancies. There had been no heir of her body there would be no heir of Elizabeth's body. So these women were sidelined. They were the barren queens who hadn't contributed to the propagation of the Tudor dynasty. And so in that sense, James, in a way, flips Elizabeth's claims to be the sort of virgin queen and seen as that as a great uh, strength back on its head and exposed her as the barren queen, which I guess ultimately she was. Yes. We think of it as the theatrical period. Do you run any of any information about a relationship with theater? Anything with Shakespeare? Any idea of the conspiracy of who he might have been? Well, I, yeah, I mean, there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of interest in the conspiracy about Shakespeare. I think, I mean, the point is, of course, that during the reign of Elizabeth, there was a great flourishing of culture and the arts, and entertainments at court became ever more lavish. And in terms of you know, what I was saying about the way in which Elizabeth is sort of elevated as the Virgin Queen. We see that in, in pageants and plays. Uh, indeed, during the sort of last marriage negotiations that I mentioned, when the court went on progress to Norwich, there was a pageant that was put on by Thomas Churchyard, who, which basically was celebrating the qualities of a virgin, of a virgin queen. And in a way, it sort of starts this trend of using plays to also uh, reflect... Uh, and, and sort of the aspirations that people want to seek in their in their in their monarch. Um, of course, Shakespeare also is interestingly, you know, in many ways as, as prominent at the beginning of James's reign. And some of the, his most famous plays are actually produced, uh, King Lear and so on, at the beginning of James's reign, as a comment on uh, this arrival of this royal family at court. Uh, so although Elizabeth, I mean, one of the reasons I think Elizabeth is so such a source of enduring fascination is not just her as a woman, uh, but also the period of uh, over which she ruled, a period of you know flourishing culture and so on. Um, yeah, I, I was going to make a further point. I've completely lost my train of thought, so I'll have to. It, was a great point. it will come back to me. I have something of a frivolous question. Is I've often heard this. It's probably a canard the idea that towards the end of her life they never really washed the makeup off her face before applying another coat. I mean, it can't be true that they just kept well, piling more and more <laughs> makeup on You her. know what, it's true to say, Elizabeth was actually quite a regular bather by the standards of the time. She bathed about once a year. Um, which was actually incredibly frequent. Most of the time, people didn't really bathe at all. It was understood, really, bathing was about, uh, it was much more of a sort of therapeutic practice. People kind of didn't really wash particularly, and it was more about you would wear uh, linen close to your skin underneath the gowns, and it was believed that the linen would sort of absorb the impurities, and that would be, you know, that would be fine. Um, so, but it's also, I mean, up to a point, you know, the, the makeup would be sort of, you know, washed to some extent but if you think about it I mean this was this was lead based makeup that was just being caked on thickly every day you know and this of course was in an era before you know lovely Clinique there are other moisturizers there are other uh, makeup removers uh, and all of that so yeah I think you know there was just this kind of level of uh, stuff on her face the whole time um, which is, you know, in incredible. I mean, what's one of the sort of interesting things is that um, it's a slightly humorous point, but uh, when I was finishing the book, uh, I was contacted by um, NBC, who I'd finished my book, and NBC called me and said, um, can you come on and I'm not going to try to do an American accent. I would do it if I was back in England, but I'm not going to do one in front of you guys. Um, 
No, 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 no. So they said, you know, hey, Dr. Whitelock, would you come on and talk to us about, we've got this crazy new theory we've heard. Um, in fact, Elizabeth was a man. What do you think about that? And uh, so I was just like, really? You want me to talk about this? So anyway, I went to um, Hampton Court and uh, met this lovely uh, interviewer from NBC. And basically, uh, this book was coming out over here, uh, which was regurgitating an age-old, centuries-old story, conspiracy, which basically goes that uh, when Elizabeth was about 12 or 13, she was sent away from London because of the plague in London. And uh, she went to a village in Oxfordshire. But in fact, she died. And uh, Henry VIII then announced that he actually wanted to go and uh, visit his daughter, Suddenly, I'm just going to check I'm not going to run out of airtime because I'd hate this to be, you know, okay, we're all right. I don't want the viewers at home to suddenly go, and what happened? What sh is Elizabeth a man after all? So basically, uh, Elizabeth died. They, what do they do? Henry VIII is coming. You don't really want to be a member of Elizabeth's household breaking the news to Henry VIII that his daughter's dead. Well, obviously, you look around the village in Oxfordshire for another red-headed girl who could play the part of Elizabeth. There wasn't a red-headed girl, but fortunately, there was a red-headed boy. So the theory goes uh, that this boy was uh, dressed in Elizabeth's uh, gowns and played the part of Elizabeth, and Henry VIII was fooled. And, and then years, the years went on, and this boy then grew up uh, and continued to be Elizabeth. And so... In answer to the question, you know, was she a virgin queen? Why didn't she marry? Well, ultimately, she wasn't a virgin queen. She was a drag queen. This is the ultimate suggestion of this book. So, um, but in a way, the serious point is that, you know, the question of Elizabeth and whether, in fact, she was a virgin and, and the kind of incredulity that this woman actually might have been uh, is just this clearly an enduring source of fascination. And not, I mean, I, you know, I'm not suggesting that... It, this is just for an American audience that would ask a question like, you know, was Elizabeth a man? Because I'd also been, you know, uh, asked by the Daily Mail back in England to also comment on this story because they were running it in their paper. So the fact is, you know, Elizabeth still fills column inches clearly on either side of the uh, Atlantic, uh, which is pretty incredible, you know, so many centuries since her death. I have uh, another question okay. that came in from the internet. This is from Danny Reynolds. And uh, I don't know what kind of evidence, what kind of contemporary evidence there may have been uh, from during her life, but he was wondering how she was essentially as a person towards her ministers, towards her staff. Was she harsh? Was she stern? Or was she caring? And was she warm? What she, do we know, really? How we, much can we know about something like that? We, know, we do know a bit. We know Elizabeth was incredibly vain. And that wasn't just because she was a vain woman, but actually, of course, as I've sort of tried to highlight, that was political necessity not to show that she was ageing. She was also a very exacting mistress. Elizabeth, as I mentioned, had these uh, women who would tend to her, and they had a pretty hard time. I mean, Elizabeth wanted to be pretty much the sole focus of their attention, and she didn't like it if her women, for example, had male admirers, or indeed, if they wanted to marry. And on occasions, we know that a number of her women were so fearful of what Elizabeth would say if they told her they wanted to get married, that they act or indeed prevent them getting married, that they actually ended up marrying behind her back. And on a couple of uh, instances, uh, for example, one of Elizabeth's uh, women called Mary Scudamore, when Elizabeth found out that she got married, she apparently broke her finger by throwing a candlestick at her. Uh, such was her wrath at the fact that, A, one of her women had gone behind her back, but also that Elizabeth was no longer the sole focus of their attention. I mean, when if indeed you did marry as one of Elizabeth's women, you really didn't have much time away from court. You might get the odd weekend away from court, um, and Elizabeth really was quite resentful of that. If you found yourself pregnant, then you would be remaining in Elizabeth's service until the very last stages of the pregnancy you would then retire from court deliver the baby leave the baby in the care of a wet nurse and return back to court so she was a very hard taskmaster she was a jealous woman um, there was a whole group of women called maids of honor at court who were these single attractive sort of 18 19 something women 
who, you know, as 18, 19 something girls are, were obviously just up to all kind of mischief with the boys at court. And Elizabeth was not happy at all. Um, and also, Elizabeth did not want them to be more attractive than her. She wanted to be the sun around which everyone spun. And I think that she struggled with the pr- aging. Uh, because of the fact that there were these young women around her at court. But, I mean, I sort of talk about her and those qualities in a sort of negative way. But the reality is Elizabeth operated in a completely unprecedented fashion as a woman in a man's world. I mean, you know, she didn't marry. She may have been supposed to marry and she may have failed in terms of um, ensuring the succession. But, you know, she survived and she managed to, to some extent, manipulate the men around her uh, by, to some extent, playing the part of a, a sort of woman who loved being wooed. But at the same time, she could also be quite fierce. Um, she was also very, well, she made a sort of, I was going to say she was very indecisive. One of her strategies was to kind of be prevaricate on things rather than come up with a definite decision. But in some cases, you could say that was a sort of strategy because it kind of kept everybody thinking that they were influencing the Queen and she didn't come down on one side or another and so therefore didn't alienate people. So it's one of those questions that if you asked about her, if she was a man and you asked about her personality, you would say, well, she was incredibly, you know, effective and hard but effective leader. Because she was a woman, we, you know, we say things like, you know, she was vain or she was, you know, stubborn or that she was, I don't know, we sort of see it as a negative thing. Um, I think Elizabeth was far ahead of her time in many ways in the way in which she managed to manipulate the men around her uh, and maintain power. Yes. Uh, did she ever, um, is, did she write a diary at all during her reign? Not as such, no, unfortunately not. If she did, I'd like to read it. Um, so, no, I mean, the, with, I mean, the problem with this kind of research, the sort of politics of intimacy, is that you have to stitch together bits of evidence from all kinds of different places. I mean, there's, I mean, one of the reasons why this kind of history traditionally, you know, wasn't uh, the main focus of historians' attention was that it's much easier to write history when you're writing about the council or about parliament. You know, you have state documents, you go to the National Archives in London uh, and you call up the the documents and, you know, tell year by year, month by month, meeting by meeting, it tells you what was going on. Um, and some historians really thought, therefore, or just assumed that that's, well, that was where politics took place. It took place in the council, in parliament. So why would you need to think about politics that might have been played out in the bedchamber or in the privy chamber? But that's kind of assuming that today, you know, nowadays, you know, you would understand politics by simply just reading the official documents that are produced by, you know, the government and not think that, you know, reading somebody's emails or reading, you know, I don't know, some of the cartoons or some of the sort of satire that appears in magazines, that actually that isn't an insight into politics too. Um, But of course, it comes with the problem of there wasn't emails uh, to read. And a lot of these things are conversations that take place clearly behind uh, closed doors. But, you know, by piecing together things like um, ambassadors' descriptions and they talk about who they're talking to, or there was a lovely letter that I found which described how one of Elizabeth's women, a woman, a woman called um, Dorothy Stafford, who was a regular bedfellow of the Queen, had broken her leg. Um, and another lady, another of her bedfellows, Mary Scudamore, who I mentioned, who had married without telling Elizabeth and for a time had lost the Queen's favour but then was restored to it. But and Mary Scudamore happened to be having a weekend away, a very rare weekend away with her husband and gets a letter from the Earl of Sussex, a courtier, basically saying, you better get back to court because uh, Dorothy Stafford's broken her leg and uh, Elizabeth won't rest easy until basically she has someone with her uh, and she needs you back in her bed, basically. So, you know, there are these lovely little pieces of uh, evidence around uh, that do survive. And Mary Scudamore, one of these ladies, there are some of her letters that survive in the National Archives in London. But sadly, we don't have a kind of, uh, you know, warts and all diary in Elizabeth revealing what exactly was going on with her and Dudley and what she was feeling and thinking. And we do have to construct it and we also have to think possibly and maybe and as a historian not be afraid to say possibly and maybe uh historical novelists get to do that all the time and sometimes i think historians can be hampered by the fact that apparently they have to say either did happen or it didn't happen Uh, and in this kind of field we have to say possibly and maybe and the significance of what people were thinking was going on actually can be as great as what was going on lady here did you have a question 
question. Uh, after all your research, do you feel that Robert Dudley actually ordered his wife to be thrown down the stairs or...? I don't... Th um, the question was, do I think that Robert Dudley ordered his wife to be thrown down the stairs? I don't think... Yes, well, throw that off, you know, yes, exactly. I don't think he did because I think it would just be too... To have explicitly sanctioned that and given that order was too dangerous because if it came back on him and he was showed to have been directly implicated, any prospect of marrying Elizabeth would have gone by the by. But I actually think that... I don't... I mean, it's possible that he kind of had suggested to a number of people that it would be incredibly convenient if his wife died and, you know, wanting to uh, please Dudley, uh, that then happened. Uh, there's been, there's a couple of books that have come out quite recently talking and investigating the whole question about um, Amy Dudley's um, death. But certainly, you know, once she died and was found in suspicious circumstances, there was absolutely no prospect that Elizabeth and Dudley could ever marry. And in fact, for a time, you know, Dudley is sort of sent away from court because people just think, you know, it's just too toxic for Elizabeth and Dudley to be together. Although actually that doesn't last for very long and within a few months he's back by Elizabeth's side and tongues are wagging once more. Since you uh, mentioned uh, historical novelists a second ago, I think we'll close on a slightly lighter question, which is of all the fictional portrayals of Elizabeth, including film, which, if any, do you feel are the most effective or perhaps captured her essence the best? Well, I should say that the BBC have optioned my book for a drama series. So whoever plays the part of Elizabeth in that, that will be the definitive portrayal. But in anticipation of that, I think that one of the incredible things about Elizabeth is such was the complexity of her character that she's attracted some of the very best actresses, uh, Judi Dench, Helen Mirren, uh, Bette Davis, Sarah Bernhardt, you know, uh, Kate Blanchett, the list goes on. And I think all of them, to some extent, have brought something different uh, to the role. Um, so I think Kate Blanchett was quite good, I have to say. Um, and clearly, you know, she's now double award, Academy Award winning. Um, so I don't think there has been a definitive portrayal because if you look at films, and what's quite interesting when you look at the films of Elizabeth, they all sort of highlight something different. And over time, in fact, they really have. I mean, in certain points, Elizabeth has been sort of championed as uh, a sort of very modern woman who puts, puts her career before family. You know, there's that, almost that, or that she's actually led by lust and of course she's carrying on with Robert Dudley and they're very kind of sexy portrayals. So actually the films are all sort of doing different things. Um, so I think those actresses all do different kinds of uh, a job, if you like, on Elizabeth. So no, I'm going to stay sitting on the fence. I'm not going to come out and say that there's been a definitive portrayal of Elizabeth. It's yet to happen. <laughs> Watch this space. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Miranda Richardson on the Black Eye. Did oh, you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, folks, uh, just a reminder for our internet audience, there's still time for you to call in and purchase a copy of the book, and we will have Dr. Whitelock sign it and ship it to wherever you are for free. Also, a reminder, our uh, live stream events are archived, so you could visit the Books and Books website, go to the live streaming link, and uh, any presentation that's been broadcast from here, you could watch it at your convenience. For those of you here in the store, we have the Queen's Bed as well as two of Dr. Whitelock's previous titles for sale at the counter over there. She's going to be signing over here at the table to the left of the podium. Uh, this was wonderful. Please give her another hand. Thanks very much.